Hello, hello. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's live stream. My name is Tyler Hakes, and I'm going to be joined today by our guest, Kevin Indig. Uh, if you're not familiar with Kevin and his work, uh, he's a growth advisor and partner at Hypergrowth. Uh, previously, he was an SEO and content leader for companies like Atlassian, G2, Shopify. Uh, he's also advised companies like Snap, Ramp, Nextdoor, Hotel Engine, uh, you know, basically tech companies, you name them, he has probably uh, been involved in their SEO strategy. Uh, and today we're going to be diving into a topic that I think is particularly interesting and has potentially given you some extra gray hairs over the last 12 months, uh, Google algorithm updates. So as many of you likely have experienced and, and know firsthand, there have been many changes to the Google algorithm happening over the last 12 months. So we're going to jam with Kevin today. We're going to unpack some of those specific changes. We're going to talk about what they meant from an SEO perspective, uh, what you should be doing to respond to those, and also what we should be thinking about in 2024 as the algorithm continues to evolve. Uh, before we get into it, uh, I have a few quick shout outs. First of all, I just want to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Positional. Uh, Positional is an SEO tool set that's designed by lifelong SEO experts. It gives you access to everything you need to start, grow, and scale your organic search channel. Uh, so with Positional, you can do things like find missing internal link opportunities, optimize your content pieces using SERP data, heat map your underperforming pages to spot problematic sections, cluster keywords, track rankings, and way more. Uh, Positional is currently in beta, but but if you're watching this video, uh, I'm going to get you VIP access, right? So you can skip the wait list and you can check out Positional today. All you have to do is hit the link down below in the description. It's going to take you to the sign up form. You can sign up to skip that wait list, check out Positional and see what it can do for your SEO strategy. Um, <clears throat> once again, just want to say a huge thank you to Positional for their support. Uh, next up, I would love your support. Uh, can you help us out? Uh, first of all, by liking this video, that's going to help other folks find it, YouTube algorithms, etc. Uh, second of all, give us a, a quick hello in the chat. So we see who all is joining us today. Uh, and number three, if you have not already, uh, as the kids say, smash the subscribe button, uh, subscribe to our channel here. We host, uh, at least once a month, we have live workshops, Q and A's, uh, all kinds of, of great content with some of the smartest folks in content marketing and SEO universe. Uh, we just put up a bunch of new workshops that are coming up over the next few months. Uh, so definitely hit that subscribe button, follow along for our upcoming workshops, Q and A's, et cetera. And one final thing I just want to note, if you are not already a member of top of the funnel, what the heck, where are you at? Uh, come join us in top of the funnel. It's our free Slack community. Uh, that's where all of this content sort of gets planned and executed. Uh, so you can join us there. We've got about 2,500 members, content and SEO folks, uh, includes a range of in-house people, uh, agency folks, freelancers, etc. There's all kinds of you know Q&A questions, tool and tech recommendations, uh, strategy guides, interesting articles, work opportunities, everything you're looking for in content marketing and SEO universe, you're going to find it in top of the funnel. Uh, so just you can join us today, yesoptimist.com slash tofu. Once again, it's a free Slack community. Um, all, you can join us there and uh, you'll be up to date on all the newest stuff that's happening and all the upcoming events. All right. Uh, with all of that out of the way, uh, let me once again introduce today's guest, Kevin Indig. We're going to be discussing today Google algorithm updates. Hello. Kev How's it going? Hey, hey. Good, Kevin. How are you? Yeah, fantastic. Glad to be on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I, uh, you know, as, as I sort of mentioned in the intro, I think, uh, you know, algorithm updates have been sort of a way of life for the last 12 months. No? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's funny because talking and writing about algorithm updates is always a little bit of a it's always a little bit of a pickle, you know. Uh, you, you cannot perfectly reverse engineer them, and, uh, and and there are so many of them, and it's 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 gotten it's gotten so much harder. You know, I, I came up in a time where you could very clearly tell when algorithm updates rolled out, and you could very clearly tell what they changed based on which queries were impacted or pages and sites. 
And these days, it's much more blurry and it's much harder. And Google doesn't give a lot of guidance. All they say is, you know, create good content. And so, you know, talking about this is is a little bit tough. You also have these two different schools of people. Uh, some say, oh, you know, don't don't chase the algo. Just just change what the user wants, which is always a bit ambiguous. And then the other group of people, you know, that goes really deep into algorithm updates. And and I kind of try to sit in between and uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, and and try to you know connect those two a little bit. Yeah, I, I'm excited to dig into that because I think that is the the sort of art of of SEO right now is kind of finding that signal, you know, through through all the noise and, and really sort of parsing all the different changes that are happening. What are the trends? What are the things that we should actually, you know, uh, translate into real change in strategy and which things are just sort of distractions? Totally, totally. It's also funny because, you know, I, I would say that 2023 was a, a year of massive change. But then again, I think people say that about every year in SEO. And so I'm just trying to like not repeat that and just show you some of the things that happened. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see in the deck. Fair enough. Yeah, it's, it's all relative, isn't it? Um, awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm excited to, to see what you've got prepared for us. Uh, just a quick note for the folks joining us. And by the way, thanks to everyone. You know, Please continue to, to pop into the chat and let us know who's here. So hello, Molly, William, uh, Liam. Hey, how you doing? Uh, th thanks all for joining us. Um, so... Real quick on the the programming here, Kevin is uh, has a deck for us. He's going to go through some of the algorithm changes and, and some of the things that he's seen in the last twelve months. Uh, we are going to have some time at the end, so as we're going through, if you have questions about you know specific algorithm changes or things that Kevin is sharing, please pop those in the chat. We will have time at the end to answer some questions. Yes, sir. All right, man. Well, I will let you take it away. Uh, let's let's jump into it. Let's do this. Cool. Um... So yeah, just just a couple of slides to illustrate uh, the main points here. Um, last year, I had the opportunity to work with a very successful startup in the consumer space. It's a, a startup with many millions in funding. And um, when I worked with them, they had already been doing SEO at a very, very high level. So um, it was a challenge to come in and see where else we could make gains and, and what else we could improve because they already did things you know very very well they saw incredible seo growth and they got hit by one of the core algorithm updates last year very unexpectedly because the content was really good link profile was good technical all everything was great and that kind of prompted me to take a take a closer look um at algorithm updates in general because even companies that are performing at a very high level are not perfectly safe from getting hit by an algorithm update. And so I'm going to illustrate a little bit what that looks like in my in my slides here. I'm not going to waste more time on uh, on my introduction. Um, uh, Tyler already did a fantastic uh, job here. So uh, we can jump straight into the meat, meat uh, and bones of this. Let's start with a little look at what's actually happening in search and what has been happening. Uh, as I already mentioned, I think 2023 was a year of peak SEO volatility. And the reason is not just algorithm updates, but also a lot of changes in the search results layout. So lots of new SERP features, uh, different um, layouts and different designs for certain queries. And so um, you'll see a lot of Googlers publicly saying, hey, you know, um, uh, like we're, we're getting better and, and SEO as a, uh, sorry, Google as a search engine is getting better. But reality is also that they're firing a ton of updates and they're making lots of different, uh, you know, changes every year, um, and and we have to differentiate between whether these are rank algorithm changes, SERP layout changes, intent changes, um, and and that becomes very obvious when you look at what Google is actually after. So, Google has this page where they started to report on their official Google updates over the last three years. Every year, Google has launched about ten updates. In 2023, there were nine official ones, but they also launched the Hidden Gems update, which promotes forum content and community community content, and which uh, is not listed as an official update here, but had a massive impact. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. So I, I'll still count 10 up, uh, bigger algorithm updates in 2023. But of course, th th there might be hundreds or thousands of different changes on Google, right? So this is not an exhaustive list, but in terms of official algorithm updates, um, they're actually launching exactly 10 every year. Um, and what's interesting is when you add a little bit of color coding to that list, you start to see a few more patterns about what Google is after. 
something you have to understand is that it takes about six to 12 months for Google to build and roll out an update. Um, it starts with gathering data uh, about what's going on in the search results and then um, you know, like creating or, or, or designing algorithm updates and tweaks and then testing them, including testing them with quality raters, then rolling them out and kind of starting from scratch again, right? So it's Google is actually not as fast with some of these updates as you would think. It actually still takes them a lot of time. And that allows for us to understand where things are going. So when you look at 21, uh, for example, year 2021, in the very right-hand column, actually, Google spent a lot of time um, on, on spam and fixing plain out uh, spam. In 22, it was more reviews um, of all sorts of kinds, specifically product reviews. And then there were a lot more core updates in 2023. And so, um, again, these go hand in hand with SERP layout changes, but uh, it's interesting to see what the different focal points are that uh, Google has when they work on their updates. And uh, 2024, who knows what else is uh, what else is coming out, but they probably already have a strong roadmap for the algorithm updates that they launch in 2024. Now, again, I said this is one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is really what the search results look like. And Google has made quite a few changes uh, from April to November of 2023. Um, and we can we can group these changes into e-commerce. So Google has given merchants or websites more structured data to add when it comes to the return policy. So you know, if you have a 30-day return policy, you can now um, uh, show that in the search results of, uh, themselves. It's more about shipping as well. Um, then we have more human content, uh, for example, from forums. So again, uh, organization schema, forum schema, core schema, all of these are things that highlight human content in the search results. Uh, and then lastly, Google actually made a few other changes by taking rich snippets away, most prominently for FAQ and how to rich snippets. Those are not possible anymore, uh, which is a shame because they, they, they work really well when it comes to improving and increasing your click-through rates. Uh, and that could be one of the reasons for why Google toned them down. But uh, they're not shy to also make changes and take some things away. That is that is very critical for us to understand. Now, um, there are four bigger um, changes when it comes to SERP layout um, or, or uh, SERP and rank uh, uh, um, layouts. One are intent shifts. So and, and user intent, as you all know, is kind of what users are trying to achieve when searching, searching for a specific keyword. And um, that is not always constant. As a matter of fact, intent can change very quickly. Think about a keyword like Independence Day, which can really be about the movie for most of the year. But around July 4th, at least in the US, people are expecting search results about the holiday. Uh, and so intent can change over time. Intent can also be fragmented, where only a certain amount of results are about one intent. And there is a number of results that are about a different intent. Uh, and what we've seen a lot last year is that um, Google changes this intent very rapidly. This is a screenshot um, of the search results for the keyword uh, CRM software, very competitive, very important keyword for, for certain companies. Um, and as you see on the left-hand side here, um, the website g2.com ranked uh, on the third position. Um, uh, you know That was uh, January 2023. And then January 24, so very recently, Google has replaced that uh, domain with others. And the thing that you need to take away here is that G2 is a review site and it competes with software vendors uh, and it also competes with publishers. And Google decided that they want a lot more vendors showing up in the top search results for this particular keyword. And that's an intent shift. The site type shift is very similar, but the intent stays the same. So people are still trying to, to achieve the same thing. Whereas for the keyword CRM software, people actually wanted less reviews and more vendors they can directly buy from. In this case, uh, for that keyword, we're seeing a complete flip of the sites that are ranking. So on the left-hand side, as you can see, um, this, is, this is also from an earlier time. And then on the right-hand side are the new pages that are ranking. Uh, and as you can see, just by how many um, pages were completely kicked out of the SERPs for this keyword. It's three pages kicked out, and then five new pages just in the first eight results. Uh, and then Reddit number one, as I mentioned before, Google really promotes more um, forum content. And then uh, for this um, keyword is Detroit Safe. 
they're showing a, a complete a completely new set of websites. And that is what I call a site type shift. And there's nothing you can do about it. That's a Google decision. Um, and uh, and you, you kind of have to live with it. Another big trend that is very interesting uh, are reversals. And reversals aren't new. But in the past, we had update reversals where the same, a new iteration of the same update would fine tune or sometimes negate the impact of the previous update. So you had a Panda update, and uh, you know Panda 2.1 would completely flip the impact from Panda 2.0. Right? Th those were very uh, um, uh, regular things you would see. These days, we see the Updates almost compete with each other. Uh, this is uh, an, an, an example from uh, the BBC uh, in, in the US, so bbc.com. And um, you see that they gained a lot of visibility when the helpful content update rolled out, but they lost that visibility again when a core update rolled out. And so these updates are not targeting the exact same criteria, but they, they will tip the scales in a direction that it negates the impact from the previous update, right? So uh, the challenge that we face as uh, as SEOs and as marketers is that um, we always have to be a little careful with positive or negative impacts from updates because we never know when the next one will come around and, uh, and, and reverse the impact. So don't celebrate too early. Uh, and then lastly, very similar or very related to that are quality reassessments where this is the, these are kind of two iterations of the same update and as you can see here, that website uh, got a lot of love from Google around March 23. And then in October 23, all of a sudden, Google changed their mind and, and reversed uh, organic traffic and positions for them somewhat. It's not that it's not an exact same reversal to the previous baseline, uh, but uh, it is somewhat of a different impact. And so that sim signifies and uh, symbolizes the, the, the strong volatility that we're seeing in the search results uh, last year and, of course, this year as well. Um, another slide that I, that I think is really important to understand here is um, this example of the keyword best power generator. I live in Michigan, and uh, we had a ton of snow coming down the last uh, week, probably uh, one to two feet. And uh, and I was I was looking for a power generator. And uh, when I when I searched for that keyword on Google, not only see not only did I see a ton of uh, product listing ads at the top, but I also saw these these product filters, and these product filters are almost the last puzzle um, or the last piece in the puzzle of Google's transformation from a search engine to an e-commerce marketplace for shopping queries. So whenever you now search for shopping queries on Google, you will find these product filters. And it's really, you know, um, it really feels like an Amazon competitor more now than ever rather than a search engine. And I think that's something that it also falls into SERP layout changes, but um, uh, it is important for us to understand the dynamics change massively here on Google. This is less of an update, more of a design decision and a strategic decision, and obviously completely changes the, the playing field and the rules of the game for uh, e-commerce companies. Um, forum content, already mentioned that a bunch of times. Not all of that forum content is of high quality, but uh, Google is really leaning into that. Um, and my personal opinion is that they do that to combat all the AI content. Um, they try to figure out how to surface content that is most likely not generated by machines, and that content often comes from forums like Reddit. Now, again, uh, I know all sorts of uh, niche site owners and spammers are thinking about how to game Reddit now for, for, for SEO, and some of that stuff works. So I'm not saying Google figured it perfectly out, but uh, I have noticed a ton of um, forums and communities gaining a lot of traffic with the Hidden Gems update. I wrote a whole article on the growth memo about that with some specific examples, it's quite interesting. Um, but that is another decision where Google overnight said, okay, we want more uh, Reddit content and placed Reddit in lots of the um, top 10 results for, for many very competitive keywords. So all of a sudden, Reddit become, became one of the most traffic sites in the world. To summarize all of that, um, a lot more content from quote unquote humans from platforms like YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, uh, Reddit, and other um, forums. Um, again, Google um, is doing a lot of work on reviews right now uh, when it comes to specific updates. So um, that is also becoming a lot more competitive. And my uh, you know my interpretation of this, they do this 
uh, to counter Amazon. They're really building this e-commerce marketplace, and they're they're pulling all the strings that they can to be more competitive in e-commerce again. Um, the, the quality bar for content is also constantly rising, which we've seen from core algorithm updates, helpful content updates, et cetera. Uh, and so uh, Google has gotten a lot of flack lately from becoming worse and quality becoming bad. There was uh, um, a, a, a study uh, that uh, was just released out of uh, Germany where they looked at product review queries and found that there's a lot of spam on Google for product review queries. So um, they're getting a lot of flag and they they don't want an over-optimized Google. They want it to feel human and natural and they're really going against over-optimization uh, to, to quote-unquote counter SEO, but more so make, uh, make Google good again. Um, and then... Um, as I already mentioned, they're really placing more value of this idea of information gain. So just summarizing the top results might not get you all the way there anymore. It's it's much more about what can you uniquely offer as an answer to a search query. And then lastly, in the spirit of, of e-commerce, um, they're also making it much easier to check out directly on Google. You can now, as a merchant in the Merchant Center, place a link to your checkout experience. And so searchers of, of shopping queries uh, can click on your result and get a direct referral to your uh, checkout experience and then buy the product. So Google is turned into an e-commerce marketplace, already has turned into one, uh, which means that some verticals like e-commerce are, uh, it's a completely new uh, playing field with different rules. Now, I highlighted tons of problems, tons of challenges. What can you actually do about this? One thing is to, to, to just gain a complete picture of what's happening. And you can do that by measuring what I call SERP volatility. So in this HF screenshot, you see the uh, top search results for the term CRM software. And as you can see on this timeline here of ranking positions, um, the the uh, there's a period of volatility where Google just throws the search results um, left and right. They do that to test and experiment and learn. And once they have higher confidence of what an optimal SERP mix looks like, then you enter this period of stability, which you can pretty pretty uh, clearly see on the right-hand side here. There is way less fluctuations, way less um, you know, unclarity. You see that the, the top result here, which is keep, um, they barely flip results. There are only a few tests here between uh, keep and Zendesk, where Google sees what happens when they rank Zendesk first uh, for a day. But uh, for the most of it, there's a lot more stability in here. And we can measure that for a single keyword or we can measure that at scale. And it's critical for us to understand because if you are at the beginning of this volatility period, you might do a whole bunch of stuff that will not even reap the benefits until you enter that period of stability, right? So it's important to know when we are in a period of volatility, um, what type of test Google is performing, right? So it's very interesting. You can see here uh, in orange Salesforce and in red, you see Zendesk and you see that Google constantly tests its, these two pages against each other. And if you see that happening for your own keywords, then you know that the, um, the, the advantage you have against that other uh, page is very small. And so you might want to think about what else can we do to make it very clear for Google that we should be the better page here. So just measuring and tracking SERP volatility goes a long way because it opens up the door to things you can do about it. But if, you, if you're not aware of this, then there's nothing, you know, you, you might be doing the, th the wrong things or you might be doing nothing. The other thing is what I call competitive density. Um, and, and all that it means is to look at how many of uh, of your competitors actually rank for the keywords you're going after. Um, on the left hand side, um, you find a, um, uh, um, a you find the top results uh, for for a keyword. On the right hand side, you find uh, another set of uh, top results for a keyword. Both of those keywords are target keywords for the same company and for the same side. But as you can clearly see on the right hand side, there are a lot more competitors present than on the left hand side where there are no competitors present. Uh, and and long and behold. Um, the company actually lost the rank for the um, target keyword on the left-hand side. And it's not because there aren't more keywords, uh, sorry, more competitors present. It's much more that competitive density is a proxy for keywords that really fit to your business model and keywords that might not fit to your business model. And the second group, keywords that might not fit to your business model, those are keywords where you need to um, 
tread softly, where we need to be cautious of potentially losing them long term because Google might decide that another set of sites is much more relevant. Uh, so this can help you to really manage expectations and uh, again, not not pop the champagne uh, before uh, you know before the next algorithm update. And the last point that I really want to drive home is, and I, and I said this earlier in my intro with Tyler, is I do believe that we can learn from algorithm updates. I don't think we can personally reverse engineer them, but I think it's the wrong call to just dismiss understanding them altogether. There's a lot we can learn from the updates that Google rolls out, the, the, the focal points that are setting, um, but also the impact that these algorithm updates are causing. And so when you think about the structure of a website, um, from a URL structure perspective, right? You have the domain, you have subdirectories, pages, and then these pages rank for keywords. Um, we can still understand algorithm impact on these different dimensions, right? So for example, we can understand traffic changes on the domain level. You can clearly see that the August core update of last year has caused a negative traffic change to that um, domain. We can then look at the subdirectory level, so before and after, which subdirectories have actually lost traffic. Um, you can see that very clearly here. And when you look at the type of subdirectories that lost the most traffic, you can already tell it's been uh, a lot of guides, right? So, so these guides pages, they were heavily affected by this uh, core algorithm update in uh, August of last year. Uh, and then we can boil that down to the keyword level. So within that subdirectory, within the guides subdirectory, um, which keywords have actually lost ranking position or traffic because of a SERP layout change. Uh, and as you can clearly see here, there is a query syntax pattern. This is all about queries uh, that, that relate to the safety of a city. So it didn't perfectly tell us what happened, but at least we know what page types and what queries were affected. And now we can go and see, okay, which actually which pages and sites have actually replaced our ranks, which ones are ranking better, and what are the commonalities between these sites and pages, and how is that different from ourselves? So we can still infer high level what happened here, which then eventually turns into, into action items and strategies. But I wouldn't go as far as completely dismissing um, analyzing these, these algorithm updates. Um, that's that's the end of my deck. I just wanted to highlight a couple of, of talking points, hopefully inspire some questions of you. I'm very excited to see what questions you have for me. And I hope that was uh, that was uh, illustrative and enlightening to some degree. Thanks for, for tuning in here. Kevin, that, that was awesome. Thank you so much for, for walking us through that. Um, first of all, as Kevin just mentioned, questions uh, based on everything that Kevin just shared or you know general questions about algorithm updates and, and changes in the SERPs, pop those in the chat. We have some time here to get insights. Uh, Kevin, I'll kick things off. I I'd love to go back to what you were just talking about, right? So you were analyzing a specific instance where the site lost rankings in this guide subdirectory and specifically keywords related to the safety of specific cities and neighborhoods. Uh, and and you, you made a great point there, which is like you can analyze that and sort of have some some clarity on maybe what changed in that algorithm update. What was your takeaway in that particular case? Yeah, this was a site type shift where Google just wanted to see a completely different type of sites. Um, mm. I cannot give the name of the site away, um, sure. but again, a site in the consumer space. Um, and, and this was not their main topic, right? To be fair, this was one topic that's related to their product, related to their to the main topics, but it was not their main um, space. And so what, what, we, what we found out after analyzing which pages and sites gained uh, when that algorithm update rolled out is that Google just wanted a lot more local sites. Um, they didn't want a global mm. SaaS company or, or consumer company. Um, they wanted local sites. They ranked a lot more Yelp. Um, local blogs, city administration, or gov government pages. So, mm. um, you know, very tough to 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 do something about that when Google wants right. to see different pages. You can kind of, you know, uh, see if there is missing content sections or angles or data. But there was a side type shift. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That that's that's awesome. And and just to to kind of refresh everyone's memory, you know, as you were going through that, you sort of outlined some of those specific types of changes that we're seeing right now in terms of you know site site type shift or intent shift th those types of things so is that generally how you map that back as you do sort of an analysis and then it sort of leads you back to one of those big types of big changes generally that's correct yep it's usually one of these four changes um and uh and then from there it boils down into smaller subsets but yeah it's usually you know people search for the same thing but they actually want to see different results 
or um, the Google is not satisfied with the side of uh, the the, uh, the type of sites, uh, or it's a SERP layout um, shift, or, uh, or or it's like a change in ranking. But I think you know th th the point is really that it's important to differentiate between all the different variables that can influence whether a site ranks and how much traffic it gets. As opposed mm -hmm. to just saying, oh, it was an algorithm update or, or we got punished. You know? it's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not always like that. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, there's, there's a lot more nuance there that you have to, to kind of dig in to understand. That makes sense. Um, awesome. Well, we have one question uh, sort of related to this. So, so Philip was asking, um, you mentioned this idea of like measuring SERP volatility as sort of a strategy for, for handling these, these uh, uncertain times. Uh, can you just kind of walk us through that process once again and, and sort of how you measure that? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, and hi, Philip. Thanks for tuning in and thanks for the question. Uh, so generally, the idea of SERP volatility is that Google will always test different results against each other. Um, oftentimes, we don't notice that. Uh, for example, when you filter um, all the way down to country and page and, and uh, device in Search Console, you will actually not, in your ranking, um, you will actually not see these hardcore fluctuations. You'll see them in hrefs. Because uh, Ahrefs measures differently, but you will not see that in Search Console. So we're often not aware, but Google constantly tests different results against each other to see if user behavior changes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, in a, in a user, uh, sorry, uh, SERP volatility um, is essentially a process where Google is not confident that the SERP mix or the, the mix of results is optimal, and so they will test a lot more aggressively. And you see these, you see these fluctuations and, and positions bounce a lot. Which, by the way, is even more complex for localized queries. We can talk a bit more about <laughs> that. But uh, another bigger trend over the last couple of years is that Google has, um, has has varied the results they show based on where you search for different uh, types of queries. But I'm not going to open that can of worms right now. Uh, let me know if you want me to dive into that. But long story short, when you see your rank fluctuation, uh, your, your ranking positions fluctuate all over the place, that is SERP volatility and. Uh, it's easier to measure on the keyword level, uh, as I sh as I've showed before. Actually, let me let me pull that up. Um, here, you see that the results are all over the place. You can detect it very simply, but it's a bit harder at scale, but not impossible. So at scale, when you measure thousands or or, or tens of thousands of keywords, um, there are a couple of things you can do. One is you can measure the average over the last thirty days, so or a running average, and see if your positions are decreasing to mm -hmm. filter out all the noise. Um, mm. which we'll see a lot of times here. So let's just take this orange line here, Salesforce. I hope that somewhat you can somewhat follow that here um, on my <laughs> video. But you see there's, especially here uh, over that um, time between, say, August 23 and September, uh, late September, so it's like a good month, maybe two months, um, there's a lot of fluctuation. And they, they come out almost at the same position, maybe one higher. So if you have the, the last 30 days average that you look at in your ranking position, you you know you filter out all that SERP volatility. That's one way to get more accurate long-term trends. But you still want to be aware of when your fluctuate when your positions fluctuate heavily, just so you know that Google might be about to reshuffle the um, the search results and maybe maybe kick some uh, pages out. So another example, and you don't see this well here, but there's this uh, site businessnewsdaily.com. Um, they ranked in the what is the top three. And then after this period of SERP volatility, they got pretty much kicked out of the top 10 search results. Um, mm -hmm. And so if I'm if I'm Business News Daily, I want to know when there's a lot of fluctuation so I can keep a closer eye on it and see uh, if there's anything I can improve about my content in Counter React. Mm. Okay. That's super helpful. Um, we have a, a bunch of questions about SGE. So I want to get to SGE, uh, but I'd love to kind of go back and, and focus first on the, the specific algorithm updates. Um, Kevin, I'd love to maybe walk through some of the, you know, the big types of uh, updates that we saw over the last 12 months. And, you know, maybe we could just do like a quick recap on kind of what that update was about and sort of what takeaways maybe we had. Uh, so, so let's start with the, the HCU, the helpful content update. Uh, can you Can you kind of summarize that for us? Yeah, sure. Uh, and I have my I have my own theory here. Um, you know, Google is very vague in what they they're like. Oh, we yeah. focus on the surfacing more helpful content. And what does it even mean? <laughs> what even is helpful content, right? It's like, uh, we we focus on on building cars that can drive, right? It's like okay, uh, no idea what that means. I personally found that the helpful content update has downgraded a lot of sites that 
are quote unquote over optimized and, and over optimized mm. specifically in terms of content. And so here's what's happening, right? Um, I'll, the, the common playbook uh, for a lot of content optimization is to look at what the top results cover in terms of topic topics and then use it as a benchmark or a goal post for your own content creation. Um, mm -hmm. And you can you can use tools for that as well. And I recommend that same approach to my clients. However, what that leads to is a ton of sites with the same content. And the, the thing that you have to keep in mind is that you want to be the result, uh, which to Google's, you know, um, uh, um, uh, you know, to, to, to speak in favor of Google also a little bit, uh, they kind of mentioned that in the questions they give us about helpful content and, and content quality in general. Um, you, you basically want to be the site or page that is the most that has the most value to provide for a search query. And what mm -hmm. that means is that by just summarizing the top three results, for example, you're, you're just getting even with them, but you're not going beyond. And, and in my personal opinion, what you have to do is you have to optimize towards getting even and then think about what else can we do to make this to make our answer and content even better than the top results that are out there. And uh, what I found is that the HCU has downgraded and downranked a lot of sites that don't make that extra step, who just summarize the top results and add to the noise, but don't have something unique to offer that's really ve relevant. So that is why in my personal experience, right? Helpful in this case refers back to this idea of information gain and being the best answer to something and not just a summarization of the best answers. Mm -hmm. Let me ask a specific question based on that, Kevin. I think a lot of people are going to hear that and, and the immediate reaction is, okay, I take what's already been written and then I just make it longer. I just add more. Is right. that is that the strategy? Is, is there more nuance in that? It's a great question, Tyler. Um, I wouldn't say that's the strategy. I would say... You know, longer is not the main driver here. Sure, if you add more value to a text, it becomes longer, but it's not better because it is longer. Uh, mm -hmm. It is better because you think about what does the user want in this case, and how can what what can we do that is maybe unique to us that helps them make that decision. So um, one example could be you know if you write about CRM software, let's just let's just take that example because it came up a couple of times. Um, then can you maybe raise some statistics about the usage of CRM software? Or can you write about, can you maybe uh, highlight a couple of CRMs that you tested yourself? Or can you provide people a click dummy of CRM software on your on your landing page or in your blog article, whatever you use to, to go after it? So it's, it's really thinking beyond just content, beyond just text. And if it's text, what are unique insights that you can provide? Or where can you go the extra mile to make the content that much better than everyone else, and that's something that I think a lot of that, that, that a lot of playbooks don't cover in SEO anymore. Uh, and in my personal opinion, HCU has targeted that specifically. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And real quick before we move on to another bucket, I just want to mention because one of the other things that came out of the HCU update was sort of the idea of it, it being like a site-wide signal. Uh, my, my interpretation of that is basically, you know, sort of any like sort of thin or low quality content on your site is uh is sort of potentially a liability for even some of your stronger uh, content is that how you interpreted that as well yeah yeah absolutely i'm a i'm a huge proponent of this idea of a site-wide quality score and, and to be fair right there's evidence and patents and 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 some of the <laughs> things some of the documents that came out uh, in, the, in the latest google trial so it's not just a, a theory i think there's some proof to that as well but tyler i'm curious like when you when you look at a site and and this idea of a domain-wide quality score and thin content, low quality, is is there like a, a common, like is there, is there a number you look at uh, or is there a process you follow to find that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, when when we've sort of assessed this with clients uh, in the last like year or so, you know, we're, we're generally looking at like what content isn't really doing anything for us. And that doesn't always mean that it's you know low quality or, or thin, but usually that's a pretty good indicator, uh, to at least in, in in our experience, that you know that content is not, as you said, it's not providing, it's not helpful, it's not providing enough information to rank, or you know it was created without you know really considering the broader strategy, the content strategy, um, and so those are the cases where we're looking for okay, if this piece of content is not really doing anything for us, is it worth keeping or should we, you know, roll it into something else or, you know, beef it up to make it more helpful, that, that type of thing. So that's kind of our, our general process. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have, I don't have like a specific benchmark of like X percent of pages or anything like that, but that, that's sort of how we assess it page by page. 
Yeah, it's always, it's always tough, right? Like, uh, I'm sure you got into these conversations as well, but I, I have tons of clients and like, cool, so how much duplicate content is too much? Or how, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know, right? Like, there's no perfect value, but um, it's, it's, it's tricky to come to a perfect answer here every time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But and just to recap for, for folks who maybe aren't familiar with this, you know, again, the, the site wide signal, the, the the premise, at least, or, or sort of the, the general consensus, as I understand it is, you know, poor quality, thin, you know, unhelpful content on your site can sort of weigh down your rankings across the rest of the website. So something to keep in mind is that if you've got, you know, even if you've got some really great content on your site, if you also have a bunch of lower quality content, that might be something that you want to reassess or, or consolidate or, or address in some way. Um, let's, uh, Kevin, can we jump into, can we talk real quick about reviews? So that's obviously was a, a big theme in 2023, the, the reviews updates, uh, again, maybe let's just start with like, you know, summarize sort of what we, what we saw there, what, what those review, what those updates generally entail, and then maybe some takeaways from, from those. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Google has paid a lot of attention on reviews. You can see that very well here, right? Like starting in 21, there were two reviews up, two review updates, 22, we had three review updates, another three and 23. And so the trend has gone towards more proof that the article or the author of the article has actually tried the product out. Um, and there's a lot of spam in, in reviews because it's it's an affiliate play, right? It's very attractive for affiliates, product reviews, very juicy. Same for e-commerce. So it's one of the most competitive uh, types of queries on the web. Um, and there was this very interesting research from Germany where... The researchers looked at almost 8,000 queries in the review space, uh, and they, they set up a test where they compared the search results from Google, Bing, DuckDuckGo, with two research search engines, uh, Chetnoa and ClueWeb. Um, and long story short, they were able to find that there is a significant amount of SEO spam on Google when it comes to review uh, queries. So, you know, and, and and spam can, like, we have to be we have to be clear. Right? We're talking about actual spam. We're not talking about SEO as spam. We're talking about actual spam sites. Um, and uh, and it's very, very interesting. I can, I can recommend uh, reading that study. I just finished reading through it last night. It's not that long, but it's very insightful about how they approach that and how clearly and easy it is to identify SEO spam at the top of the search results. But it's something that Google is constantly fighting up against. And so um, they are really promoting articles that have um, uh, tested the actual products with proof, like pictures and the, and the, the wording and the writing. Uh, they want a very clear demonstration of expertise, right? So um, uh, uh, there should be editorial standards. There should be a methodology of how the product has been tested, et cetera. Uh, so they really want that kind of standard of the wire cutter, like how the wire cutter, they know that there is an editorial team to actually take the products and use them. And they have, you know, like there, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. And that's the type of review content that Google wants to highlight. Um, consumer report would be another example that that, uh, that that is the best practice in this space. Um, and what's important to understand about the reviews updates is that if you cross a threshold of review content on your site, this up, this update can impact your whole site. So I've actually worked with the mm. site, um, and they are um, um, it's it's a massive, huge affiliate site, uh, part of a, a private equity company, and um, they have um, maybe maybe thirteen, fifteen percent of pages on the site are actually reviews of products, and the rest mm. are are listings and category pages, and they saw a huge negative impact from that update because some of their review content was not uh, was not up to par. So Google is very aggressive about that. Um, mm. And they, they try to weed out as much low quality review content as possible. Again, part of that is to reduce spam and helpfulness or, or usefulness of Google as a search engine. And the other part uh, plainly is also to uh, pave the way for e-commerce and becoming a, a marketplace, right? Uh, mm. We all know how important reviews are on Amazon even when you buy products not on Amazon, you check out the Amazon reviews, uh, and Amazon fights their their share of spam as well. But Google knows the importance of reviews when it comes to making e-commerce decisions, and they they, they want to weed out all the low quality stuff as they're transforming into a marketplace. That that's su that's super interesting, and and I think that that sort of bleeds into to two other topics that I'd love to to explore. So one is the idea of topical authority, because I think that that sort of maybe contrasts a little bit with with what we're seeing in the review updates and the other one is uh eat right so so you talked about demonstrating expertise or i should say eeat sorry we have the two e's uh 
so, so maybe let, maybe let's start there. So uh, yeah, obviously one of the big themes I will say from the, the last 12 months or so has been the expansion of EAT, EAT to EEAT uh, and its impact on SEO in general, but I think specifically reviews have, have been uh, central here. So can you talk a little bit about what you've seen there and, and sort of what maybe practices have come out of the, the changes? Yeah, totally. So uh, in terms of EAT, um, the, the new E stands for expertise. And so uh, interestingly, it came very shortly after the hype around AI started. So I forgive me when I don't remember the exact month and time that uh, EAT transformed into EEAT. Uh, but it was shortly after the AI hype started. And so you could theorize, I don't have proof for that, but you could theorize that uh, Google is moving more towards, um, you know, things that that differentiate AI content from non-AI generated content. And so search engines cannot really have expertise. They can fake expertise, but sorry, mm. I, I mean, AI cannot uh have right. expertise. It can fake expertise, but it doesn't have its own expertise, at least not yet. And I hope for 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 a while. Uh, but um, <laughs> but yeah, that's something very human. And so you'll see in 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 you know in in the uh, in the the trends of these algorithm updates over the last uh, at least two years that how Google searches for indicator that content was created by a human instead of AI. They don't say AI content is bad per se, but they try to highlight the human element because. If all content on on Google is just created by AIs, then, then why not use an LLM straight away instead of a search engine, right? So they try to still find and build value in using Google apart from chatbots in the future, mm -hmm. uh, or whatever the the format of AI is, and uh, and and EAT is one way as a quality filter to highlight more search results that clearly demonstrate expertise. Um, in my opinion, there's three main factors. Um, the biggest one is probably links and mentions across the web, right? Uh, Google still mm. like this idea of authority and uh, and uh, and expertise, uh, or EAT in general. I think is, is still very driven by links and uh, um, and mentions. And then the next big element, in my personal opinion, is just the content in itself, because you can tell very quickly the difference of an expert writing a piece of content and an amateur, right? So somebody mm. who who writes about say. I have to think of an example. Uh, say working out, right? Like uh, fitness. Uh, somebody who has been, who's a coach, or has been working out for twenty years, thirty years, they will use different terminology and different topics to explain a question than somebody who just summarizes the top results. So mm -hmm. it is very indicative in just the word choice and how the content is structured, um, whether this was written by an expert or not. Uh, and the last tiny, mini little bit is probably who wrote the content and 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 do users get the impression that that's an, an actual ex expert and that the site has high editorial standards. So user behavior uh, in relation to trustworthiness will probably also mm. make a little bit of a difference. But that's that's how I dissect and, and see EAT in my experience. And then topical authority kind of goes into that um, because you, you obviously trust a site more that is focused on a topic than a site that writes about lots of topics, but you will find outliers like uh, like Forbes Advisor, for example, and they rank for just everything. Uh, mm -hmm. and they're not clearly specialized. So topical authority is not the end-all be-all. You'll find sites that will compensate with just sheer authority uh, and be able to rank for everything. But the basic idea is that sites who, are, who cover a topic very holistically get a little bit of a rank boost over sites who cover many different topics or maybe cover a topic and don't go as deep. And so mm. I personally measure and quantify topic authority by traffic share. So when you take all the keywords in a space, say uh, sleep, right? Where you have pillows, mattresses, and a whole bunch of other things, you research all of these keywords and you see which domains get the most traffic. That to me is topical authority because it's kind mm. of indicative, right? If you get the most traffic for a, a topic, that means you must be the biggest authority in that space for that for that topic. There are obviously underlying mechanisms as well. Again, like backlinks, like content uh, optimization, all that kind of stuff. But uh, the, the the quick and dirty is just that topical authority is essentially the market share for a topic that a site gets. And if you want to increase that, you want to you have to rank better for more keywords. And uh, you know, into that goes stuff like EAT and lots of other things. So as you can tell, it's a Pandora's box. I can talk about this all day long, but I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Yeah, no, you, you you covered it perfectly. So I think, you know, if we think back to what you were saying about the reviews updates and, you know, focusing on a site like Wirecutter that they cover a bunch of different topics, but they go super in depth. It's very, you know, they have specific high standards and, and authority, that, that type of things. I think in, in the past, 
what happened is that a lot of these like affiliate sites, especially tried to use topical authority as sort of a, a shortcut for like a truly robust, like review process basically. And, and that was effective for a while. And I think what we're seeing now is that it's less effective because Google is sort of valuing that less in, in this context. Yeah, I'm totally with you. You also see a lot more AI generated reviews. Um, and yeah. uh, it's very easy to fake topical authority with AI because you can cover a lot of keywords very quickly with lots of content. Uh, yeah. But then Google will layer on stuff like user behavior and backlinks, right? So it's it's really a layer cake that matters most here. I'm totally with you that uh, in the review uh, affiliate space or niche site space, topical authority was like a, um, a vessel for a while to get ranks uh, that you maybe didn't deserve. But as Google yeah. is getting smarter, they're just taking the check marks, uh, the, the check boxes, um, and they're looking for that, you know, like besides topical authority, are people looking for the brand? Tons of people are looking for a wire cutter plus product because they want to review specifically from wire cutter, which also happens with Reddit, by the way. Tons of a good chunk mm -hmm. of people um, search for Reddit results specifically. And that, of course, is a huge indicator to Google that that site has a higher relevance for that specific topic um, or a keyword that people are looking for. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. Um, all right. So, uh, we have time for a few more questions here. Uh, so first of all, if you do have any pending questions, please pop those in the chat. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, let's go ahead and jump in, Kevin, if you don't mind, uh, a little bit of a pivot here. So this is a little bit less about an algorithm update per se, but still obviously relevant. A uh, couple of questions related to SGE and AI, right? So um, Liam uh, is wondering if SGE is going to eat up the majority of SERP results and uh, make competition more stiff than ever. So I guess real quick, Kevin, maybe you can just summarize your current thoughts on SGE and, and what its you know sort of macro impact might be on, on SEO moving forward. Yeah, sure. Um, SGE, obviously one of the biggest SERP layout changes you can think about. Um, I will say, I think there's still lots of question marks uh, about SGE. So even if SGE rolls out, will users really adopt it? Um, what queries will it show up for? For example, right now for shopping queries or local queries, it doesn't offer a lot of value, maybe shopping comparison, but um, when it just comes to a list of products, then SGE provides a very similar list that you also find in the regular search results. So mm -hmm. the answer to the question here is dependent on the industry and vertical we're looking at. Generally, I'm in the camp of people who think that the impact of SGE is gonna be massive. Um, in part because I see it in my own behavior. Uh, I see that uh, I'm using chatbots a lot more. I'm spending a ton of time with ChatGPT. I find the the results, though sometimes it hallucinates, to be way better. Um, and, and I can ask much more pointed questions. I get much better answers. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff here uh, happening if SGE potentially rolls out. But you can probably somewhat gauge the impact by looking at your featured snippets. Those are going to go away. Uh, many of simple question queries. So if you filter your ranks for what, when, how, who, um, maybe where, those will probably all go away. And so these very simple, shallow informational searches will probably not drive traffic anymore. But then when it comes to um, more down the funnel types of queries, right, where it's comparisons or products uh, searches or reviews or so, um, I think that that's some traffic that we will uh, probably still keep. Even though Google will give part of the answers away in SGE, that's, in my mind, a more complex intent where people want to dive a bit deeper and they might want the answer from an authoritative site. So um, depends a little bit on the type of queries we're talking about, the industry, and then lastly, the time as well. Um, last year, I was pretty bullish that SGE was going to launch pretty pretty soon. And now my opinion has shifted to I think that SGE will evolve. Google will keep building on SGE and, and making it better, but might not launch it until they're forced to. Until, for example, they see that, mm. just, let's just say, you know, ChatGPT or Perplexity AI gets a ton of uh, attention and a lot more users get there and they use it all the time and they see their own numbers going down. But right now, my opinion is that Google keeps um, SGE in the back pocket in case they have to use it but they rather not use it because it really disrupts their own business model and it's a big question mark and wild card. And so before they drop that nuclear bomb uh, into their cash cow, uh, they might just you know keep evolving it behind the scenes and then uh, pull it out when necessary. 
Nice. Okay. Yeah. That's uh, I think that that's fine. I mean, obviously the short answer is we don't really know, right? <laughs> we don't know. We so don't know. To, Absolutely. Yeah, there, there's so, so much to consider there. Uh, and I, I love that, that, totally. uh, you know, sort of unpacking it. Uh, so, so sort of a related question here. And then I, I want to wrap up with just a couple of quick rapid fire ones. So if we could just spend a couple of seconds or a couple of minutes on this. Uh, so, so Jesse is basically asking, you know, okay, let's, let's assume a world where SGE rolls out, uh, you know, some people, uh, some sites, some industries are likely going to see a big impact there. Uh, so, so maybe I can first start with his question, which is, you know, how do you talk to clients or your boss or whoever <laughs> about that and, and sort of uh, explain that? And, and secondly, you know, I'd love to know, Kevin, are, are there any specific action items that you recommend uh, for folks who might be more impacted by SGE? Sure thing. Uh, so how to talk about it is a tricky one. Um, it's obviously a massive ecosystem change. And uh, Tyler, as you already said, for the most part, we just don't know. Um, <laughs> I've seen some attempts at qualifying and quantifying how much traffic we're about to lose. It's very, very difficult. It's much more speculation. So we won't know until we know. And uh, at the same time, I see this as an opportunity of a level playing field because we're all starting from scratch. There's, I, I wouldn't say that anybody really has an advantage here. Maybe some people have spent a lot more time with SG than others, but for the most part, we're all starting from scratch. And it is an opportunity to enter a period of experimentation and learning. So the wrong way to go about talking to your clients is probably to say, I know exactly what to do. And the, I think <laughs> the better the better uh, part here is to say, look, we all don't know, but I know how to test into this and how to experiment and learn. And maybe we find some things that only we know and our competitors don't. So then you can use that as a, as a means to pave the way and kind of uh, reset expectations. Um, the other point, uh, there was a second part of your question, Tyler. Can you remind me real quick? Just if there are any specific action items for sites that are, are impacted by SGE. Yeah, I mean, um, I would put together a list of uh, of queries or questions. Um, so you basically, you go through keywords and you either turn them all into a question, like an actual ex explicit question, or you only focus on the ones that actually are a question. Don't use head terms because nobody goes to ChatGPT uh, and just searches for sneakers, right? Like you, you want to search for something like, I don't know, what sneakers have the highest durability or what sneakers are optimal for back pain, that kind of stuff. So you, you turn all your keywords into questions uh, and then you regularly query them on uh, on uh, uh, ChatGPT uh, and uh, and other LLMs. There are, there are Google Sheets integrations that allow you to pull answers from the API so that you can constantly rerun these queries, but just get a sense for where and how you show up in uh, in ChatGPT today as a proxy or a high level idea of you know uh, of what it might be in SGE. Again, it's not, it's not a perfect uh, model to predict exactly how you're going to be impacted, but that can at least allow you to measure and monitor over time and give you a high level idea. And then everything else, again, uh, we don't really know. Um, <laughs> there are a few pointers about how SGE works, but. Uh, we need to we need to redefine quote unquote ranking factors and how all of that stuff really works. A, a few things that we can already tell is that product reviews from third party sites are more important. You can already see those being used a lot by Google. Um, the way you phrase things becomes a lot more important. So think about it as a featured snippet on steroids. But uh, again, I don't I don't think anybody has a complete playbook for optimizing for SGE, which then again makes it fun and exciting too. <laughs> that's very true yeah no, i think that that's a great you know the, the starting point i think is all about the data as you said we've got to figure out and you got to me measure things in a new way so that then as you said you can sort of test experiment and then ultimately learn um awesome well we are down to just our final few minutes here uh kevin if i if i can i have a couple quick hopefully rapid fire questions for you uh number one uh in your opinion did the search results get better or worse in 2023 <laughs> oh god um i'm team worse okay uh and the reason i'm saying that because it's not just about what which, which pages are ranked at the top but what the what the experience on google looks like and i think the experience is way more cluttered on google with way way too many ads and other serp features yep uh looking at sort of the macro trends here were there are there specific sites that won and specific sites that lost or, or types of sites I think in general, um, you know, quick and dirty affiliate projects, niche sites, faceless brands are generally on the loser side of things. Publishers, because of their ad model, are also struggling. Um, and I think, you know, any site that is closer to an actual transaction, like e-commerce, uh, I'm not saying every e-commerce site wins, but they still uh, have a, a much better pulse on 
the impact of SEO broadly, whereas say a SaaS company with a one year sales cycle, they have a harder time. So high brands, like if your brand is growing and brand searches are growing, you typically see organic traffic growing as well. And, and mm -hmm. I mean, non-branded organic traffic. So, you know, brand, 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 um, lots of attention to content, quality over quantity type of sites. Uh, those are generally the winners. Awesome. Well, well, Kevin, I know you've got to jump right at the, we're at the hour here, so I want to respect your time. Thank you so, so much uh, for joining us today. This was super insightful and, and helpful. Hopefully everyone on the stream uh, got a lot out of this. Um, please, again, if you haven't already, pop into Top of the Funnel. We'd love to have you join us there. And uh, And once again, thank you so much, Kevin, and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, too. And what I will say is I have had the honor to try out Positional, and uh, it's, a, it's a really cool tool. Uh, so I'm glad that they're the sponsors. I wasn't paid to say that, uh, but uh, I just <laughs> wanted to give that shout out real quick. And thank you, Tyler, and everyone for tuning in so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you as well. And, and yeah, hit that link in the description if you haven't already to check out Positional. Thank you so much to, to them for sponsoring us today. Awesome. Well, thank you again. Have a great rest of your day and, and talk to you soon. Cheers. Cheers.